beginning of the month. So then the pastor comes up to me and he says, look, you're probably not going to want to do preaching the week before VBS, and you're probably not going to be wanting to do it. Did I say that right? I'm sorry, the week after VBS or the week after your vacation. So why don't, instead of you doing your normal night, why don't you just do it this Sunday night instead? And I was like, well, that's funny because I actually had this message. And then Pastor gave his message this morning. And this is like basically, I don't want to say the same thing, but very much so built upon it. So this message is called Abundant Sufferings. You know, oftentimes when growing up in the church, you hear about you know God's abundant mercies and God's abundant love. We're going to talk about abundant sufferings. I think that's kind of a topic that everyone uh, can relate to. Um, so we'll be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, oftentimes we say something like this. If God would just fix it, or maybe, maybe God doesn't care, or maybe, maybe God can't fix it. You know, and, and we go through these hard times, and we, and we kind of get different thoughts that go through our heads, different doubts that come, go through our heads. And I think that Paul has a lot to say about that in 2 Corinthians. So if you'll um, look with me here in 2 Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 3. Um, if you don't know where 2 Corinthians is, it's in the New Testament after Romans. Paul, um, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective and the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also, are, we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. And did we have the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. You also joining in helping us through your prayers, so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us through the prayers of many. Um, so kind of a lot of stuff going on there. Um, kind of says a lot of stuff in very confusing ways. And it takes kind of a little bit to decipher, you know, hey, Paul, what the heck are you talking about? Uh, I've actually already preached um, one of the very first sermons I ever did was out of this exact same passage. But we're not going to look at any of the points that I made in that sermon. Um, so we'll kind of go verse, uh, step by step here. The first thing I, I want to pay attention to is in verse 3. Blessed be uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. So first, notice how it addresses God. God is called the Father. Now, why is that important? We don't just call, father, call God Father because it's fun. It's not really his name. His name isn't Father. God isn't even his name. So why, do, why, why the emphasis on calling him God the Father? It says there twice that he's God the Father of Jesus Christ and God the Father of mercies. Well, the idea of Father is someone who's close, someone who cares, and someone who provides for what you are in need of. That's the idea of a Father. Especially in the ancient Near Eastern world where this was written, there's the idea of a family unit. And a, and a father would be over that family unit in the ancient world. In other words, um, he would be responsible for the whole family, which was a good thing and a bad thing, because if you as a child were to dishonor your father, d disrespect him, you would dishonor the whole family. And anything that you did would reflect on the father, and anything that you accomplished would reflect on the father. For instance, in Genesis, it talks about um, Israel, before he dies, says... I conquered this piece of land, but he didn't conquer that piece of land. His children conquered that piece of land. But it counted for him, to him because he was the father, he was the head of the household. So I, I just, it's not, it's not really a common idea in our culture, but I hope you don't miss that. 
So then that takes us to that second part there at the end of chapter, or verse 3 verse, and the beginning of verse 4. The Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction? Okay, now we have another piece here. So God comforts us. He doesn't just abandon us. So we kind of have a little bit of the answer, questions that we've, that we've asked so far already answered. Maybe God doesn't care. Well, no, he's our father, so he does care. Maybe he can't. Well, no, we just have that one resolved too. So let, let, let's, let's keep looking at this. God comforts us, but how? How does God comfort us? It's one thing saying that God comforts, but it's another saying, well, how is that process going to happen? Am I going to wake up one day and just be comforted? Am I going to pray and all of a sudden, you know, just get lifted up in prayer? Or what, what does that look like? What does it look like for God to comfort someone? Okay. Now, once you remember that question, we're going to come back to it. Uh, going on to verse 4. Who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God comforts us so that we can comfort others. Well, okay, this is filling in more pieces of the puzzle. Okay, so God's kind of expecting this ongoing process, all right, where we can get to the point of saying, I know what you're going through, and I can now have an impact on somebody's life. See what I mean? For those of you who are married and have had some difficult times in your marriage and stuck through it, well, now you're going to be able to go to other people who are struggling in their marriages and say, this is how you get through it. I know exactly what you've been doing. You know, before you get married, I mean, they couldn't do something to make you mad. I mean, sometimes they even try, and you're like, that's fine, sweetheart. Then you get married, and everything is great because, you know, hey, you know, we're having sex, and everything's great. Well, then give it, a, give it about a year or two, and all of a sudden you're like, man, oh, man, I hate you. Why did I marry you? What was I thinking? You know, it's the process there. And when we get past that honeymoon phase... It's good to know someone who endured that, who's able to then turn to us and say, look, I know what it's like. See what I mean? God comforts us so that we can comfort others. It's an ongoing process, which leads us to this inevitable uh, uh, conclusion, if you've ever seen The Matrix, the sound of inevitability. Uh, that means that God will withhold comfort from us if we don't reach out to others. Did, did, did you catch that? That means if God gives us comfort so that we can go out and comfort others and we do not pour into someone else, that then God will not give us comfort because we are not using comfort properly. The reason why comfort is given is so that we can comfort others. It's an ongoing process. Okay, Think of it as like the body. This is a great example that I just thought of. Okay, It's like the body. Your heart pumps the blood, right? But it doesn't pump it just a little bit down the artery and then say, I'm going to stop there, right? That's, that would go against the purpose of the heart. The heart pumps it all the way through your body and then sucks it back, through, back in. It processes the blood all throughout the body. That is how God's comfort works in this body. He pushes it out. You could call the Holy Spirit the heart if you really want to push the analogy. He pushes out the comfort, and then it's supposed to spread and keep pushing among itself, and then that should cause us to reach back to God, who then gives out more comfort. See, everything in the New Testament talks about a church who is holy, separate from, separate from sin, but also one who is bound together, who is there for each other, not one who doesn't have time for each other. How can the finger say to the foot, I have no need of you? See what I mean? It, it, God didn't intend for the body to work in isolation. And this is one of those things that really drives that point home. So God will withhold comfort from us if we don't reach out. Well, now let's follow that, that, that idea here. That means when God brings you to a struggle and he gives you that courage to keep going, and you then take that and sit your butt down on your couch and don't do anything with it, what will happen the next time that a struggle comes? Well, it'll be a little bit harder to get over it because you aren't using the tools that God gave you. See what I mean? God wants us to comfort others as we are comforted. If we don't use that, he won't comfort us. You see how that works? It's, it's a process that he does 
to get us to seek after him and then to pour into others. See, loving God is, you, you, you can't separate loving God from loving people or loving people from loving God. It's, it's all connected. And I just kind of hope that you get what I'm saying because I'm going to move on. For instance, um, you know, a lot of people who say, oh, no, I'm saved or whatever. Well, you've been saved 20, 40, 50 years, and you're still self-focused. Everything's always still about you. Whenever you're going through a struggle, you don't care about anybody else. Whenever you're not going through a struggle, you don't care about anybody else. It's always only about you. That's a good sign that even if you are saved, you're really immature as a Christian. Because, once again, the idea of a Christian is meant to be something that's not so self-focused. It's meant to be more self-sacrificing, more um, making a way for another person. Does that kind of make sense? Kind of like the body, once again. If you take an artery out of a human body and put it on the ground, it's not going to do much good. But if it's connected with the body, all of a sudden it's of extreme importance. So then we say, okay, well that's fine. But all I face are problems. Well, I've been there before. <laughs> it kind of seems like I live on that street. But hold on. But wait, there's more. Paul has more to say about this. So then we get down to verse 5. We finished up verse 4 that says, Who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Okay, good. Whew. That was a mouthful. A lot, of, a lot of really hard things to say in there. So then we get to verse 5. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance. Now, hold on. What did you just say? Just as problems are yours in abundance. You have plenty of problems. Okay, well, great. Well, then he says this. So also, our comfort is abundant through Christ. Well, all I have are problems. Well, good news for us then. There's comfort that is never ceasing. Just as our sufferings are abundant, so also is the comfort. See, Paul just completely circumnavigated the issue. But you don't understand, Paul. Oh, no, no, I do. You're, you have a lot of problems. But there's better things ahead. So suffering is abundant, but so is comfort. Think of it like this. God is a well that always has water. Have you ever gone to a well that ran dry? It doesn't matter if it's the old one with the barrels if it's the really old ones that you walk down into, <laughs> or if it's the one with the pump. It really doesn't matter what kind of well we're talking about. When you go to get water from it and there's just dust at the bottom, I mean, it's kind of kind of discouraging, right? But when, when you go to turn on, like I think it's Joe, I think, has a sprinkler system that's hooked up to a well. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, when he turns that on, water comes out. That's God. There's always water in that well. God is a well that never run, runs dry, no matter how thirsty you are. What does that mean? Well, let's, let's start taking this apart, okay? Because I really think that we're not getting this. Let's say everything in your life is going wrong. I mean, okay, most of you won't have to imagine real hard at this, okay? Most of you. Some of you might be in a good place in your life. Well, fine, good for you, I guess. But most of you probably aren't. Okay, uh, <laughs> a better table of one, babe. Uh, <laughs> no matter what you're going through, what failings there are, that means there's always more comfort to draw from God. Which means, hold on, that means there's at least one way that God gives us comfort through other Christians. Right? Because if God gives comforts so that they can get, then go give others, that means that we aren't the only ones who are going to be comforted. That means that God is also comforting others who can then comfort us. Okay, well, that, that means we have to not be prideful about the process. As God uses other people to minister to us, it's important that we just kind of go with it. Does that mean? Don't get the idea that you know everything, that you felt everything, you've experienced everything. Don't get that. Okay, so that's verse 5. And then that takes us to verse 6. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Well, let's just stop there for a second, okay? 
That means that in our sufferings, we are enabled to reach out. In other words, the bad things that happen enable us, they equip us, they make it possible for us to reach out to others. Ben, are you are you doing things behind me? Yeah, okay, good. Because I forgot to be telling you to do stuff and things, so sorry. Um, okay, let's see. So it enables us to reach out. And there's a word here that appears, and I want to kind of clarify. It says here in, in verse 6, But if we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. He's not talking about salvation as in salvation from sins. He's talking about more of um, persevering in the, in, in the faith or um, saving you out of the problem that you're in. Kind of as a means of, okay, let's say, you know, hey, Timmy fell down the well. And Lassie goes and tells, you know, the people. And so they're able to go and get him out of the well. See what I mean? That's, you saved him from the well. See what I mean? That kind of makes sense. That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about salvation in the sense of, of, of faith. Um, and, but then also, if you notice, he's, he also says this. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. See what he said there? No matter what's going on, it's for your best interest. Well, well okay. What does that mean? It means this. When we are suffering, we are being equipped to help other people. As they suffer. Even if we never leave that place of suffering, we're still being equipped. But if we do get victory over that, if we do, okay, if we are comforted, if we have victory, if we have encouragement, we should share in that encouragement. Okay, let me put it like this. Okay, let's say, let's say I get cancer. That would be a suffering. And then I'm able to then go and help others. Okay. So I'm suffering, you're comforted by my suffering because I'm able to then glorify God by it. Now, let's say I'm then healed of my cancer. If I am comforted, well now you get to experience the joy with me. If I am comforted, it is for your comfort. See what I mean? That's how God wants us to deal with the sufferings. He wants us to be used in the process. But the problem is, is that we feel sorry for ourselves and we get to places where we're just tired we're just tired and we don't really <laughs> you know but Paul has Paul has a solution to that too that takes us to the last part of verse 6 so okay here's what we got but if we are afflicted it is for your comfort and salvation if we are comforted it is for your comfort which takes us to this part of the verse which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Now, there's three different translations here I want to look at. The first one is from the NIV. Uh, ben, if you could put that on the screen there. It reads something like this. It is for your comfort, which produces in you endurance. The comfort produces endurance. Okay? Then the ESV says, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you endure. There's a big difference there. Okay, let me kind of backtrack here. The first one, the NIV your comfort which produces in you endurance. The comfort produces endurance. In other words, God comforts you, and then when you have a problem, you're able to endure it. It produces endurance. Okay, all right. But then the ESV, that's a different thought. It is for your comfort which you experience when you endure. In other words, there's a problem first, and then you get comfort. Those are two big different thoughts. That's basically saying my endurance is dependent on the comfort, or... My comfort isn't dependent on the endurance. Those are two exactly opposite ideas. Well, we have two different translations. Well, that's very unhelpful. I looked it up in the Greek, and I couldn't figure it out either. So I looked up a third translation, the NASB, which is the one I'm reading out of, and it said it a little bit confusing. It said this, okay? It is for your comfort, which is effective. And the patient during the same sufferings which we also suffer. Now, what the heck does that mean? It is effective. Like, I, I, don't, I don't get what you're trying to say here. And you work a little bit harder here. So I just substituted some words. It is for your comfort, which is effective or adequate in the enduring. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is adequate. Whatever you're going through, it's sufficient. And the enduring. The comfort is sufficient to get you through the enduring. So that, that, that's, that's helpful, but that still leaves us with what is the correct idea of this verse? 
And I think it kind of has a few ideas. Which comes first is the real question. And the answer is yes. Comfort when needed. In other words, as you go through suffering, you are comforted, which helps you to endure and receive more comfort so that you can endure and receive more comfort and endure. Well, that seems like a little bit of a, what is it called, hamster in a wheel? <laughs> Okay, all right, you know, okay, Paul, I, I, I get it. It's kind of a circular argument you've got going on there, Paul, but okay, all right, I'll, I'll stick with you. Let's see what we got to say in verse 7. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our comfort. Wait, what? Yes, he did just say that. He said, I know you're going to suffer, I know that you are suffering, and I know that that means you're going to have comfort. Well, what about now, Paul? <laughs> What about now? Come on. If you experience suffering, you will experience comfort. You can take that to the bank. Now, before we go any further, I feel the need to say sufferings of Christ. Okay, a suffering of Christ is, for instance, hated for doing what's right. Doing what's right continually and continually getting spit on for doing it. Sufferings of Christ. Where everything's going wrong and you're still depending on God. Sufferings of Christ. Now that is, to contrast that, is the idea of consequences of mistakes. Like, for instance, I beat my wife, so I got arrested. Well, that's not the sufferings of Christ. You shouldn't have beat your wife. <coughs> see, I mean, there's no sufferings of Christ in that process. Did you see the difference? The suffering of Christ is something where we are doing the right thing. And being treated wrong. A consequence of our actions is we're doing the wrong thing and are treated wrong. So there's a whole different thought that's going on with that. Okay, all right. Let's stick with you a little bit longer here, Paul. So then that leaves us with the idea of, okay, so what if I am in this problem because of something that I've made? I really can't cling to this promise. Well, that is true, but if you turn from your wickedness and stubbornness, from the evil thing that you are doing, you stop doing the wrong thing, and you start doing the right thing, basically, okay? And we start changing our lifestyle, God will change that. And we will suffer for a little bit longer because we will be paying the price of the evil that we have done. But as we continue to do good things and seek God, and I'm not talking about karma. I'm talking about obedience to God. I'm talking about living righteously. Living according to God instead of the lusts of the flesh. Now, what are the lusts of the flesh? That's a big, big fancy term that most of us don't get. A lust of the flesh is the passions of life, right? The desire to get more wealth. The desire to be popular, the desire for sex, the desire for drugs, the desire for alcohol. The things that consume us in this life that we, we, we have passions for and we strive after that ultimately produce nothing that is eternal. Laziness is a lust of the flesh because we would rather do nothing than do something, most of us. It's a difficult process to go out your front door, Bill Go Beggins. If you guys don't watch movies, it's fine, it's fine. I watch enough movies for the both of us. So verse that takes us to verse 4, verses 8 through 9. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. Boy, you're really a happy person, aren't you there, Paul? So that we... Would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the, dead, raises the dead. What? You're saying that that load of nonsense that you went through, God was using? Yes, that's exactly what Paul was saying. Exactly what Paul was saying. Because the problems that we go through, it takes away our pride and it takes away our self-reliance. If we never had a problem, we would think that we were the greatest things in the world. We would think that we had all the answers. But when we go through sufferings, we realize, I'm not that great of a... Pop-Tart. What's that flavor that nobody likes that they discontinue? You know, that gross chocolatey looking one? Ugh, you know the one I'm talking about. It doesn't matter. That's, that's, that's a good example. So that encourages us to trust God. 
Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves. Now that's, now that's some very serious suffering. So that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Now why did he say that? Because I'm going to keep on trusting in God, and even if I die trusting in God, I know that he'll raise me, raise me back to life. Even if I have nothing left to give and I die of apathy, not literal death, I'm talking about emotional death. I die of apathy. I no longer care. I no longer have the desire to care. I know that God is one who raises the dead. God, I've hurt too much. I've done too much for too long. I'm just tired. I'm sick of these people. I hate them. Whatever. Well, then God is able to breathe new life into that dead heart. Okay, so the day says to verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a peril of death. So now we're talking about something that happened in the past. And will deliver us. This is in the future. He on whom we have set our hope. Present. Okay. Notice the tenses here. Okay. Who delivered us. Past tense. From so great a peril of death. And will deliver us. We're looking forward to the future. That's future tense. Okay. He on whom we have set our hope. Something that we have finished doing. Right now. Right now, we just finished doing that thing. We, we have set our hope, right? Like if I'm, I have looked at that back wall right now. I'm looking at it right now. I, I, I have finished the process of looking at it. We have set our hope. So do you have that on the screen there, buddy? So here we have in the middle, that's where we are. Hope in him. This is the now. This is where we are now. We're setting our hope on him now. Okay. And we're looking back to the past, and this gives us courage in the now. What he has done. And we're awaiting the thing in the future. The future fulfillment. The thing that is to come in this process. Okay, so it's kind of a, a three-stage uh, process there. So he has delivered us before. He'll do it again. God is, basically what Paul is saying is this. He's consistent in his behavior. This is how he acted back then. So I know that that's how he'll act whenever we're in the future. Now notice that Paul never says when in the future. He never says that. He just says when it does happen which I know it will, because this is how he has acted in the past. And that's one of the big parts about the Bible that it has to say about God, is that he's a consistent being. If you know anything about other deities, uh, for instance, ancient gods, or you know the gods of the Hindus, for instance, there's really no consistency in their character. They just kind of act according to the situation. But Yahweh shows a big key difference in that he is always consistent in that character. He's always the same yesterday, today, forever. <clears throat> There's never a moment in his being where he ceases to be what he is. Now this is something that I specifically, I will say it, I heard this from God and he said, I don't change my character when I'm dealing with people who aren't acting according to my character. I, see that's another statement there, isn't that? That's saying basically that when God brings about punishment on someone, he doesn't do it how we would do it. He does it according to his character. Well, that's a big statement too. So we're just gonna wrap it up here. Hopeless situation, set hope on him, he will deliver us. He has done, hope in him, future fulfillment. There's this, this same idea here, okay? So then it takes us to verse 11. Which, man, oh man, I tell you what, this one really confused me to no end. You also joining and helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed to us, oh, I'm sorry, on us through the prayers of many. What? What? Well, okay, so I kind of broke it down here. Pray. That's the first step. Favor given by God, or grace, if you want to use that word, that's fine. Favor given by God. Our response is giving thanks. Okay, so now you also joining and helping us through your prayers, that's the first step, so that thanks may be given, future tense, when this thing happens and God answers us, so that thanks may be given. He jumps ahead to the third stage there, and then he's going to jump back to, this, to the second. So that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor bestowed on us. Now he's back at the second stage in the process. To the prayers of many, back at the first process. Now, why did he say it like that? I don't know. But I do have an idea. In Greek, you don't really write your sentences like you do in English. In English, you start and you end. Like, okay, Chuck is wearing a shirt with red. 
Well, in Greek, you don't really do that. See, the end of the word tells you what its function is in the sentence, okay? So if I wanted to draw attention to the fact that Chuck's shirt was red, I would say, red, Chuck's shirt that he's wearing. You see how that works? So what's, why did he write it like this? Well, my opinion is that his emphasis is this. You also join in helping us through your prayers. In other words, pray for us. We're struggling. We're having a heck of a hard time. Pray for us. That's his main emphasis. So what will happen when we pray? We'll read it again. And I, and I, I tell you, uh, get a piece of pen. I mean, sorry, a pen and a piece of paper. Because this really, how he words it, it's very difficult to understand. Or get an easier to understand translation. Either or. As we pray, God will give us favor. And as, we give, as he gives us favor, our response should be thanks. We come to him with thankfulness as he has answered us. So that takes us to the including conclusion, the, the finale, the, the, the fireworks. You know, everybody, you know, gets to jump out of the seat and woohoo, we get to go home now, okay? All right. In conclusion, number one, pray. Okay. Number two, set hope on him for deliverance. Doesn't matter what you're going to, set your hope on Christ. Or you can go the rest of your life being depressed. You can deal with the same thing over and over again, never conquering it, and you can enjoy living your life with no joy. Or you can set your hope on him, and then no matter what happens, your hope is secured. And that hope bears a fruit. And what is the, what is the fruit of that hope? Joy. Joy. Okay? So, the third thing, perse persevere. The fourth thing, comfort others. Don't get to be a constipated Christian. That's where God blesses you and you decide, well, that's as far as this process is going and you keep it to yourself. It's not good. Pastor just talked about it this morning about the idea of ministry and teaching. That's a sign of maturity, not how long you've been saved, but what you do with your salvation. Perfect example. So anyways, and so trust God for comfort. And that's the last of the in conclusions. So just to make sure everybody understands what I'm saying. So how do you get that comfort? Well, through enduring and suffering, the suffering itself gives you God's comfort. That sounds like a little bit of a nonsense, but he just explained this pretty well, I think. As we go through the, through the sufferings, God gives us comfort. Okay, This is something that's given to us by the prayers of others, by other people comforting us who have gone through what we have gone through. Okay. This is something that comes to us as we seek after God. This is something that comes to us as a result of setting your, 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 your focus on God. As you set your focus on God, you are comforted. As people pray for you, you are comforted. See what I mean? It's a process. So all these things are really how you get that comfort. You can't take out a part of that puzzle and then say, look at what I've made. You have to put all the pieces together. Have you ever put a puzzle together and you're missing just a few key parts and it just drives you insane because there's holes in the puzzle? Oh man, you burn those puzzles, okay? If you can't find the pieces, you burn them. It's terrible. So anyways, we're going to we're gonna end there. If I could have Chuckle uh, pray for, uh, just close the service in prayer and then if I could.